nearly 100 years, Sharon Sawmill was the heart of the small hamlet, Sharon Hollow, along the River Raisin. Built around 1834, the mill provided lumber for the surrounding community for nearly 100 years. In the 1920s, Henry Ford visited the countryside in search of a new small manufacturing plant. He set his sights on Sharon Grist Mill, which was located next to the sawmill. Fascinated by the old sawmill, Ford captured mill owner George Kirkwood, sawing timbers before the mill was dismantled in the early 1930s. The sawmill was powered by the churning waters of the River Raisin. Energy from the water was captured to turn the blades of a 48-inch turbine. The turbine is located underwater, so it cannot be seen. The turbine was connected to a shaft, which in turn, was attached to a series of belts, gears, and wheels, providing power to operate the mill. This is Mr. George Kirkwood. He operated both the saw and grist mill after his father passed away in 1900, until milling operations ended in the late 1920s. Here Mr. Kirkwood is performing a task he did often, cleaning sawdust from the mill gears. The saw at Sharon Sawmill was an up and down muley saw. The muley is simply the bare saw running between and kept in place by guides. The best muley saw will make about 350 to 400 strokes per minute. The muley only cuts on the down stroke, chiseling wood away to make the planks. The muley saw does not move to cut the log but the carriage in which the log rests travels along a wooden track drawing the log into the saw blade. After sawing a row, the carriage is moved with the ratchet gear to a line for the next cut. The process had to be repeated at both ends. Steel spikes, called log dogs, are driven into the end of a log by a large mallet, keeping the logs in place on the carriage. George Kirkwood is turning a wheel to adjust the flow of water to the turbine, thus regulating the speed of the saw. The carriage is positioned in between a front and rear head block. Once the length of the log was cut, the carriage needed to be stopped by hand, or automatic trip, to prevent sawing through the log end and striking the rear head block. The bottom of the saw blade is fastened to a beam, but the top of the blade runs free. Wooden guide blocks above and below the log keep it running straight and confined to its track. There is a slight jerk back when the saw moves up, clearing the teeth from the log, so it is free in the upward stroke. The incision created as the saw moves through a log is called kerf. Vertical lines, called furrows, are etched onto the boards by the up and down motion made by the heavy saw teeth.
The chain Mr. Kirkwood is pulling gigs back or reverses the carriage when the length of the log has been cut in order to remove the saw from the timber. Since the log is not sawn all the way through, what remains at the end is called a stub shot. This must be removed by hand once all the boards have been cut. Once again, Mr. Kirkwood uses the ratchet gear to reposition the log for the next cut. Steel log dogs hold the log in place. Here again we see Mr. Kirkwood is turning the wheel to regulate the amount of water flowing through the turbine. Occasionally the blade will get stuck and would require some prompting to get the saw moving again. Sawmills were typically the first permanent structures established in a community in order to provide lumber to construct homes, barns, and other buildings. As pioneers settled onto new land, the land was cleared of trees and rocks to make way for farming. Sawmills provided a way to turn timber into usable lumber or cash. It's unknown how the Kirkwoods or previous mill owners were paid for their services. It is possible that some patrons brought logs to the mill in exchange for money, or customers might have paid cash for having timber sawn. Most likely patrons bartered with Mr. Kirkwood for sawing their timber. A benefit to having a stub shot end was the lumber could easily be removed from the carriage in an entire piece. After dislodging the cut timber, Mr. Kirkwood uses a tool called a cant hook to rotate the lumber off the carriage. A cant hook acts like a lever. It's a movable iron hook attached to a wooden handle that grips logs in order to move them. Mills were a hazardous place to work. Sharon Sawmill did not encounter too many incidents. However, one tragedy occurred when someone drowned in the mill race. On another occasion, disaster was averted when a child discovered a small fire among the gears, which could have destroyed the entire sawmill and spread to neighboring buildings. Working in a sawmill was labor intensive. In Michigan, mill hands in the late 19th century worked long hours in poor conditions and generally earned between $30 and $50 each month. Though necessary to a growing community, sawmills often negatively impacted the environment. Sawdust was mostly swept into water below the mill, polluting streams and destroying fish populations. It wasn't long before settlers noticed the negative effects sawmills had in their communities.
Again, George is adjusting the flow of water to the turbine. Water dictated the amount of sawing that could be accomplished in any given day or season. During the summer when water levels were low, little milling could be accomplished. Additionally, spring frequently produced many floods. The water would get so high that it sometimes stopped the turbine, halting operations for weeks at a time. By the 1920s, Sharon Sawmill was a novelty. In fact, by the Civil War, circular saws far outnumbered muley saws, since they were more efficient and incredibly fast. Moreover, steam-powered portable sawmills ultimately made stationary sawmills obsolete. No longer did folks have to sledge logs to the sawmill in winter, because steam-powered mills operated off of coal and could travel to the customer. As Sharon Mills transitioned from a local milling enterprise into a Ford Village Industries plant site, the old sawmill on the property was dismantled because one man, Henry Ford, recognized the important role sawmills had in shaping history. A way of life nearly extinct in American culture at the time was documented for future generations. <laughs>